It's the underdogs back with you. Can you feel it, Peter? I can. can. You know what's coming? I, I, it's, it's, you know, uh, unlike Damian Lillard, I am not leading a lonely life right now. I am surrounded by all my favorite emerging college basketball teams because I'm immersed in studying and watching and breathing. That's right. The bracket breakers, the long shots, the underdogs, the Cinderella's all coming your way, courtesy of us, right? That's right. And us being, I'm your host, Jordan Brenner. That is my co-host, Peter Keating. And Peter, let's let's dust off some calculators today. Let's listeners, let's gather around in a circle. We're not going to get too into the weeds, but we want to get a little uh, a little smart with you today on a couple of subjects. Jordan, is so that you is guys... that your new is that your new haircut or a propeller turning on the top of your head? Anyway, when Peter's done making ridiculous comments, we will get into two important things. One, some of you may be planning to draft fantasy baseball teams. Others, just getting into the the lay of the land for baseball. So we've got some breakout guys, some undervalued guys who are worth watching for some reasons that might teach you a little bit more about the game. So even if you're not a big fantasy player, stay with us, listen, maybe you make a couple prop bets. There's lots of ways to apply this. But first, but first, as you know, Peter and I have sort of made our mark back at ESPN with Giant Killers, The Athletic with Bracket Breakers. We project NCAA tournament upsets. We've got a model. It's called Slingshot. It has identified lots and lots of things that every March tell you who's going to pull up big upsets in the tournament. We are so psyched, less than three weeks from Selection Sunday. But we want to tell you right now that if you want upsets in your bracket, we've got a few teams you should be focusing on right now as the regular season concludes, as conference tournaments get going, that you should want to see in the bracket. And Peter... Let's start with a team we actually mentioned a couple months ago, but it's worth mentioning again, the Indiana State Sycamores. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Are your lights still on? Because when they come in the room, they shoot out the lights. So, Oh, Peter uh... is so witty. <laughs> That's right. You may have seen them. They have Robbie Avila and his mm-hmm. goggles at 6'10", also known as College Jokic. He shoots 41% from three. He's putting up a 17-7-4 season. But it's not just Avila. They've got five guys who score in double figures. They all shoot threes. They're arguably the best shooting team in the country. They lead the nation in effective field goal percentage. They take half their shots from three and hit 38% of them. The only thing that keeps them from being going from a good bracket breaker to a historically great one is that they don't force turnovers. They don't grab offensive rebounds. But still, they're leading the Missouri Valley Conference by a game. But Drake is right there. Yeah. Joe Lenardi right now has them as an 11 seed as the automatic qualifier. They're 31st in the net rankings, only one in three in quad one games at four and one in quad two. So uh, the, the thing is twofold. Peter, does this team have a shot at an at large if they don't win the conference tournament? And if not, should we all be flying to the conference tournament to root them on? I would love to say they have a shot at an at large because I think uh, rewarding teams that do well right now under the system we have now, you can do great all season long. Dominate your conference. Listen to the platitudes about conference championships, <laughs> college football and basketball season. Then your entire season can be spoiled on a Wednesday afternoon if you trip up in a conference tournament, right? Uh, I think rewarding a team like this is much better for the game and also creates better matchups, better 14 and 15 seeds instead of allowing just the conference champions who may not be the best team or let alone the best killer and the best team in their conferences into the tournament. I've ranted about this for years to absolutely no effect. Unfortunately, things seem to be moving in the opposite direction, Jordan. How many at-large teams are there going to be from any non-major conference? Now, Leah, the Mountain West, okay, it might get five or six teams in, but the smaller conferences, I think maybe the Atlantic 10 will get lucky, will be lucky to get two I don't know if anyone else is going to get more than one. So team like this is the classic example, Indiana State, classic example of a team that has to sustain this level of play through its conference tournament. It's a tricky yep. thing. It's a tricky thing, too, to be dominant all season long against inferior opposition, still retaining the talents that is. It's going like to be really the interesting to, to, to watch play as an underdog. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch their case. If they don't win the, hopefully it doesn't come to that. Hopefully they win the conference because we want to see them in. But they do have an at-large case to make over a lot of these, you know, 
mediocre big conference team. But let's move on, Peter. I know there's a, a, a smaller conference team you want to talk about. It's my favorite team in the whole country right now. Jordan, have you been following Samford? Oh, I have. It's 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 crazy. First of all, Samford is coached by a guy named Bucky McMillan. He is not a backup infielder for the Milwaukee Braves. He is an actual he is an actual <laughs> he's an actual coach who made his bones not in predicting giant killers, but in winning high school championships in Alabama. This guy had no college track record. He just built great programs in Alabama. I think seven state championships before he came to Sanford. Now, this is an undersized but extraordinarily aggressive team. This team ranks 10th in the country in steal percentage. They also do things unlike Indiana State. All the other things you want to see a giant killer do. They hit the offensive boards. They're great at forcing turnovers. Uh, and they shoot 40% uh, and they shoot from threes. threes. They shoot 40% yeah. from threes and take a lot of shots from three. Um they have a the, sense of I just wasn't though they have a sense of humor about their emerging identity too. Like at the beginning of the season, they shot a comedy video of one of their shortest players facing off a guy who against a guy who was really tall because they were going to open the season against Purdue and they had him going against Zach Eady for the first play of the season, which is yes. great. The kind of thing you yes. want to see. They did lose that game by 53 points they to did, Purdue. They and, crushed in that game. But as we talk about, if you're an underdog, if you're a giant killer, High risk, high reward strategy. Doesn't matter how much you lose by, you have to give yourself a chance to win. It, that, if it's if it's win or go home, who cares how much you go home by? Now, what that game does kind of allude to is that they've played in, other than that crushing loss and a ten point loss to VCU. They've played no one. Um, they've got a really really weak schedule, so it's not like they're in the at large conversation. But in auto bid in the same league, um, that the same league that gave us Furman last year, Furman? right? Yeah. Yep. In, in fact, Furman was up six against Sanford and couldn't get an inbound pass uh, straightened out in the last 45 seconds of a game last week and lost to Sanford. Sanford has a long winning streak. Yeah, they're 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 way ahead in, in the Southern Conference, which is kind of a conference of killers. The teams and, you know, if you compare conferences, SoCon teams shoot a lot of threes and force a lot of turnovers. They always generate somebody fun in the in the big dance. Right. All right, well, here's a team that's basically playing its way out of a bid, but <laughs> if they could somehow... I feel so bad for this team right now. I know, because we love them because they're ridiculous. But Texas A&M, they've lost four straight games. They are in the toughest conference in the country in the SEC, but they're, they're 15 and 12 now, 6 and 8. It's really gonna, they're going to have to win out their last four regular season games and make some noise in the SEC tournament to have a shot at an at-large. Otherwise, they've got to... The the four losses have been bad too. They've been every which right. way. They had three tough grinding losses, and then they got blown out by uh, by Tennessee. Right? I mean, just but, but the but the reason why we love this Buzz Williams team is because they're the best offensive rebounding team in the country. They cannot shoot. Okay, they they they're three hundred sixtieth in the nation in three point shooting at twenty seven percent. They can't. They're three hundred fifty second in effective field goal percentage, but they get. Almost half their misses. They're offense right. rebounding forty two point four percent of their missed right. shots. So it's hilarious to watch them play because they miss, they go get the ball. They miss again, they go get the ball. They miss again, they go get the ball. And we've seen teams like that. I think of the Minnesota team that beat UCLA, that upset UCLA a few years ago. Yeah. We've seen teams like that be really dangerous in March, but damn, they've really screwed things up lately. Well, you know, we try to give, we don't just say A and B add up to C. We try to give people sketches of what teams play like through their statistical tracks, mm -hmm. right? So here's an easy one. Texas A&M misses their, all their shots, but grabs all their offensive rebounds. Unfortunately for them, and it's been really painfully evident the last in these last four losses, they're not hitting second chance shots. They're not even hitting second chance shots at the rate, which is horrible, that they shoot for the season. Ordinarily, I'd say, well, over time, that'll even out. But they're running out of time. They have four games left. And and it looks, you know, Joe Lenardi said about this team, they got five quad one wins, which should make them a lock. But then those five wins go away fast when you take when they try to pass the eye test. Well, speaking <laughs> just, of running out of time, we're almost running out of time to for this segment. So let's real quick hit on the I think the most interesting conference race down the wire, and that's the Ivy League. You, who would have guessed, first, right? The Ivy League is good, first of all. And you've got three teams that are 9-2 and two in conference play. Princeton is probably the best overall team of the bunch, if you look at metrics. Cornell, the best overall killer, which we'll talk about in a second. And Yale is also 9-2. and two. They're just sitting there. But Ivy Madness, top four teams advanced to semifinals, is going to be super fun. We will be there at Levy and Jim, my, my old stomping grounds at Columbia. But Peter, 
real quick, um, make the case for Princeton. Obviously, we saw them at, make the uh, Sweet 16 last year with two big upsets. Make the case for them following it up again this year. Look, number one, they're a better team than they were last year. They just are. Like, they were 15 seed last year. They're a stronger team across many categories this year. Number two, they play slow. It's not quite the old Princeton offense, but they play slow. They take a lot of threes, and you can count on them to play smart. Um, also, look, I felt for I felt for Cornell last year because they were bombs away. Cornell's better than they were last year, too, but Cornell's defense is ex is very... How can we say suspect? Well, Cornell, first of all, is coached by a uh, former Princeton player and former teammate of Mitch Henderson, Brian Earl. Um, what's cool about Cornell, they, they do all the things you want. They force turnovers. They shoot a lot of threes. They don't necessarily shoot them well all the time. They actually hit 62% of their twos, so they have the ability mm -hmm. to go inside when they want to. And you got to love Chris Mannon who is third in the nation in steal percentage at 5.8. So they actually, yeah. we have a secret sauce component of our, you know, when we look at giant killers or bracket breakers, and they have the best sauce of this group. Princeton's the best overall team, and, and anything to say about, look, Yale's hanging in there. They're 9-2. and two. They don't profile metrically the same way that these two look, teams do. Prop, props to Yale. Yale, yeah. Yale used to be a tremendous offensive rebounding team, but, but James Jones... He can't recruit the very best players. What he has done is an excellent job of adapting his team to the players he can recruit, which means some years they make for good giant killers and some years they don't, but they're always excellent, sustained excellence. I mean, they're a good team. I think this race is going to come down to who has to face off in that semifinal. Like if yep. there's there's a team that has to play one game to get to the to get to the to win one game to get that auto bid, it'd be a lot better off than the two that have to face off against each other. Well, and Yale has the edge in these last three games because uh, Princeton yeah. and Cornell have to play each other. Um, so the loser of that game will almost certainly be the three. It's just a question of who potentially wins a tiebreaker to be the it's two. It's not but predictable because Cornell's already beaten by Princeton, I think by 15 points. And by the way, what that what the hell's happened to Harvard? I just want to ask. Like, like, like come I I, I thought. You know, is it is it that Tommy Amaker didn't get the Duke job? I, I don't know. What's, what's I think on? it's they realize that you're one of their alums, and it's so depressing to everyone on the court that they're just not motivated <laughs> to win anymore. I showed up for basketball games when I was there. I'm sure that was a joy for everybody in the arena. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, let's uh, let's take a brief break, and then we'll be back with some very fun, very cool, very smart baseball takes. 